Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in person and also joining online via Zoom today for our webinar. I would like to start, as we always do, with the lighting of our chalice. And today we just wanted to offer a very, very simple chalice lighting. This one is in honor of our first principle for the inherent worth and dignity of every being. Welcome everybody and um, I said being. <laughs> David, are you, are you going to uh, give special welcome and introduction of our guest? My wonderful wife, Deborah, will repeat me. My wonderful wife, Deborah, will repeat me. And so today, by coincidence. So today, by coincidence. Is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. It's Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Every third Thursday of May. Every third Thursday of May. So wonderful. It's a wonderful coincidence. So, um, yes, Amanda Schuper was hired by the Unitarian Universalist Association. So, Amanda Schuper was hired by the Unitarian Universalist Association. Part time. Part time. As a commandment to disability justice as a commandment to disability commitment. commitment to disability justice or a commandment either way but um yeah i've been reading about disability justice i've been reading about disability justice that concept goes back a couple of decades and the concept goes back a couple of decades so wonderful to have a national commitment to this. So wonderful to have a national commitment to this. Rev. Amanda is down in Georgia. Rev. Amanda is down in Georgia. And as well as disability justice. And uh, as well as disability justice. I love that you have a mental health interest and passion. I love that you have a mental health interest and passion. And uh, I especially love the fact that you're in the coalition. And I especially love that you're in the coalition. Side of love. Side of love. For the UUA. For the UUA. And that coalition brings together many, many Social justice causes. And that coalition brings together many social justice causes. And the minute I saw we were included. And the minute I saw that we were included. I knew we had to have this conversation. I knew that we had to have this conversation. So welcome, Amanda. So welcome, Amanda. Thank you. It is so wonderful to be with you. And uh, I should also thank Patrick for doing ASL. And I also should thank Patrick, who's doing ASL. Kat, who's doing tech. And Kat, who is doing tech. And our, our other discussant. Our other discussant. And our other discussion, discussant, Rev. Jen is Rev. Jen, or Reverend Jen Young Sung Roo, or Reverend Jen Sung Young Roo. Yes. So, and we encourage folks to be posting comments questions 
And we encourage folks to post comments and questions. And you can either use the question function. And you can use either the question function. Or the comment function. Or the comment function. And, uh, and I assume we'll have time for Q&A. And I assume we'll have time for Q&A. Well, we will. Well, we will. And please note whether you'd like to be visible or not. And please note if you'd like to be visible or not. Okay. All right. So, Ref, Amanda, please tell us about the general concept of disability justice. So, Rev. Amanda, please tell us about the, the concept. General concept. About the general concept of disability justice. Of disability justice. Sure, my pleasure. I, I am so thrilled to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much. I guess it's early afternoon where you are uh, down here in Georgia. We're heading into the evening, but uh, I am just honored to be a part of this forum. And, you know, for years and years and years, we have talked about accessibility as being sort of the, the main piece of um, the disability world and, and our fight for rights and equal access. Over, year, over the years, though, we've started to learn and understand that disability justice, that disability um, needs and desires and hopes and accessibility is all tangled up in a wide web of various and sundry uh, other oppressions. So we know that disability is one of the identities that is seen across the board of identities. So people of color are disabled. People uh, who identify as LGBTQIA plus um, are disabled. And so in knowing that and recognizing that, we realize that we are stronger together and that by putting a disability justice lens on all of the um, justice work that we do, we are able to serve um, communities in bigger, better, and broader ways. And so the work of Side with Love uh, is to, my job at Side with Love is to really put that frame of disability and accessibility um, onto the work of justice that we do as an association. And so my job is a very, very brief nine hours a week, but we're working on uh, hopefully extending that across time. But this is a wonderful step in the right direction. This is a wonderful move uh, into a really cohesive understanding that we need each other and that oppression anywhere is oppression everywhere. So we spend time talking about how the, dis the disability community is impacted by things like uh, our in a criminal justice system, how the disability community is impacted through uh, our reproductive uh, rights system, uh, how the voting uh, acts are impact disability work as well. So just a real understanding that we are all connected and that we are stronger together. Feel free to jump in. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Hi, Amanda. Hi. I've got a question for you. You mentioned that your current position is a nine hour a week position. Can you tell us a little bit of a history within the UUA of supporting disability justice? Sure. Have there, so been, have there been other staff people before? Well, yes, there have. In the early 2000s, the UUA actually had a position that was working around disability, mostly around accessibility services within our congregations and in the broader world. And that was uh, staffed by the Reverend Devorah Greenstein, who was one of my mentors coming up into this work. Uh, her position and, and that position was 
cut over the years for budget constraints, but uh, the uh, Equal Access was a group that was founded around that same time. I was one of the founding uh, board members for that group. And one of the real strong uh, missions of Equal Access was to find ways to make sure that disabled uh, uh, desires and needs and, and what we were coming to the table with was really taken seriously within our association and, and how it impacted us both internally as congregations as well as out into our broader communities. I'll be really honest, as an association, we've not done a great job um, in the past of recognizing the needs beyond just basic accessibility. And I think we're moving into a stage where we understand that basic accessibility is not nearly enough. We want full immersive inclusion um, without having to demand it all the time. So I see uh, a real shift in priorities of really making sure that we are understanding that disability and as an identity is just as important and as central as all of our other identities. So I see the UUA making this shift. There's also another a position that has been uh, brought forth that came on at the same time mine did, and that is held by Gretchen Ma, I believe is, uh, is Gretchen's last name. And Gretchen works uh, with uh, one of the identity-based ministry groups working specifically on accessibility um, mostly and, uh, and ha helping congregations in how to uh, raise capital, how to be more accessible, how to start accessibility groups. Uh, she's based out of uh, St. Louis, is also a person who is uh, disabled and uh, is a wonderful resource. She's done wonderful things both in her own congregation, and I know she's doing wonderful things for uh, our broader association as well. Yes, we have had Gretchen talk with our ATF Accessibility Task Force. Yes, we've had Gretchen talk to our Accessibility Task Force. I'm really eager and to hear about your personal story, your background, your experience. I'm really eager to hear about your personal story, your background, uh, and your interest. Yeah, so I came to this work very, very early in life. I have a younger brother who has uh, struggled most of his life with several mental health concerns, as well as a traumatic brain injury in his early 20s. And so I grew up, uh, I'm eight years older than my younger brother, and I grew up more of a second parent to him, tagging along with my mother as she advocated for services and and care and support that he needed uh, in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s. I, I sort of learned in the school of hard knocks as it was about how to navigate these systems. And then in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with a, a chronic illness as well as living with uh, anxiety for most of my life. Uh, I really came even further into this work when I had my first child and I ended up um, having postpartum depression uh, that I knew was happening, but I was trained as a social worker. And so I knew exactly what to tell the doctor to avoid being flagged as someone who had postpartum depression, because I was terrified that my child would be taken away from me. That was the, you know, the anxiety that I had as, uh, as a, a lesbian living in the South. And, um, then knowing that I was struggling with postpartum depression. And I went through that pretty much alone. And that was a terrifying experience for me and really opened my eyes to the reality of how mental health impacts our lives in every facet. Uh, 
Uh, and so I have spent uh, all of my adult life advocating for us to come out of the closet, as it were, uh, with uh, in talking about mental health specifically, because I believe that the more we talk about this, the more we normalize that we all have various struggles, uh, the more that we understand that we're not alone, the better we are able to serve each other and our broader community. That was one of the things that I discovered uh, when talking and telling my story throughout the years, people come up to me all the time and go, oh, I just, I so feel that I have a family member who, or I'm, I myself have struggled, but I don't tell anyone. And it breaks my heart to know that people feel like we can't talk about mental health and mental hygiene in ways that are productive and not shamed, um, understanding that we're all in this together and that by supporting each other, we lift each other up and we're better able to navigate this world that's not always built for um, people who experience the world differently. Did you have another comment, David? Oh, that's great. Thank you for your lived experience. Background. Yeah. Thank you for your lived experience background. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have another question, if that's OK. So recently at, the, at our regional um, meeting, the presidents of the UUA and the UCC churches got together and they had a discussion about the future of liberal religion. And they talked about how important it was for um, the progressive religionists in this country to speak theology to um, counter all of these oppressive systems that we have in the world. And so I just wanted to see if um, you had any thoughts about um, theologies that we can counter and theolo theologies that we can support um, in this arena of um, disability justice. Sure. So I came up, I was raised Catholic and Jewish. I like to say I have enough guilt for a small country. Um, but in, in, in that, I was... I received messages as a child that to have a disability, to struggle with mental health concerns meant that I was broken. And I think that is something that we hear a lot in theology, that if you just pray hard enough, if you just are if you're if you just are better if you do more if you're if you're good then you will be quote unquote cured and that is a, a, a dangerous and very harmful theology and we see that in, in in numerous theologies that we just got to pray it pray harder pray harder and um and 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 you will be or we're seen as the um uh, the inspiration, right? That, you know, if you are uh, pushing through, as it were, or overcoming, then you are an inspiration. You're not just living your life in a society that was not made for, for you. Um, and so I think we get into really dangerous territory when we, when those theologies are what play in our head. I really love the idea of remembering that our theology as Unitarian Universalists is centered and grounded in love. And that if we start from there, if we understand that who we are in that moment is exactly who we need to be in that moment and that our lived experiences as, as people with disabilities is enough. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to try to, you know, overcome all the time. We don't have to, you know, be, uh, I don't believe in a vengeful God. I just don't. I believe that very strongly that we are made um, in a divine image and that that is enough. And so the problem comes in our world, that our world is not made for us. And I hear all the time, you know, we cannot uh, possibly manage to uh, meet every accessibility need. I hear this constantly and I'm like, well, why not? Have we tried? 
We haven't even begun to do that. And I feel like the same thing is in our theologies is that we haven't really even be able, haven't begun to really look at how um, these theologies of, of pray it away um, or brokenness uh, do not honor the lived experiences that we have. So I don't know, that's a rambling answer. I apologize, but. <laughs> no, that was really great. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. I'm uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about UUA and National Commitment on Disability Justice. Uh, I'll just mention, like, some people. Do I never? Sorry, I am keeping short. Uh, if you could talk about the National Commitment on Disability. If you could talk about the National Commitment on Disability. Some people confuse this with equal access. How are they working together? Some people confuse this with equal access. How are these working together? So that's a great question. So equal access was really one of the driving forces behind making sure and holding, um, you know, our, our association accountable to the disability community over the years. And so they, we have, as, as equal access have sort of been that, um, that, you know, that constant drip of, hey, we are here. Hey, we, we need a, we need to have a space. Uh, in, at the conversations we need, not just, you know, to be able to get through the door, but we need a space at the table as well. And then once we're there, we need the fidgets and, and all the things. And so equal access has been sort of that driving force towards uh, making sure that this conversation hasn't stopped. Uh, so uh, several years ago, equal access and the UUA entered into conversation about how the UUA could financially support and and create um, more space for disability justice work within the broader framework. And that took a lot of conversation. Equal Access and the UUA currently have a memorandum of understanding that uh, created these two positions, both Gretchen and myself, uh, and uh, established them as sort of a starting point, a launch, if, if you were, a launching place towards making sure that these conversations are not just an add-on or a tagline onto what we say we're doing. Uh, lots of times over the years, we have heard uh, us talk about racial justice and uh, reproductive justice and all these things and disability justice or you know, disability rights is always at the very end. Uh, I have noticed a real shift in the last several years of that conversation. And that's been through a lot of hard work and advocacy, both on the part of equal access, congregational based uh, uh, justice groups uh, and individuals in, in continuous conversation with uh, broader staff talking about how we need to make this a central part of our justice work. And so by placing my position within the organizing strategy team of Side with Love, I am able to then not only work with staff, but create new resources for congregations in how to do and how to add disability justice as a frame to the justice work that congregations are already doing. For instance, if congregations are working um, around decriminalization in terms of uh, looking at how our criminal justice system works or doesn't work. We have to include uh, disability within that framework. We know that a huge majority of people who encounter uh, the police are often experiencing a mental health crisis and they're not being connected in solid ways to mental health services. Instead, they're being criminalized. And then once they enter the system, we're finding out that they are more at risk for further abuse. And so we can't separate these two conversations. 
even in our environmental justice work, we, we need to have a, a disability justice frame because environmental our environment uh, impacts us all and people with disabilities experience that even in even greater measure, especially with climate change and with becoming climate refugees. So we experience it there. We experience it in reproductive rights, in the reality that people with disabilities often aren't seen as sexual beings. And so, um, and they are not often given the same level and quality of services that our um, temporarily able-bodied counterparts are. And so just recognizing that if you've got a justice issue that you're working on, I guarantee you there is a disability justice frame that can be put on that work in order to expand it. The other thing that we are trying to do in my position is to help congregations who are organizing and doing justice work really learn how to engage and make space in leadership for people with disabilities, because that's something that we often don't see either. We have these campaigns that aren't accessible in any really strong way or that don't look at all the ways that we can make these campaigns accessible. So one of my goals is to really help congregations engage in conversation about this is how you make space, not only for the worker bees, but also for people with disabilities in leadership models. Hey, Amanda, I'm wondering within the justice in the disability justice movement, is there tension between mental health and physical disability? Yeah, there, you know, and that is a tension that has existed for as long as I think the movement has. And I think a lot of it still has to do with the stigma around mental health and um, our real lack of understanding of how do we faithfully engage uh, with people who are in mental health crisis or struggling. And, and, and there's just this real idea of what mental health looks like. And unfortunately, that often plays uh, is played in through our media. And we see this, you know, both with physical and mental health issues. But uh, I really think there is some tension. And I think that's just going to take time to work out and understand that, um, you know, while we can't see mental health struggles generally uh, just by, or they're not as necessarily as visible, uh, they still exist. They still impact in heavy, heavy ways. They still are just as expensive as other uh, physical disabilities, uh, and they still impact families in the same way as well. And so I really think that there's some internal work we have to do uh, in terms of remembering that we're all in the together and that uh you know most of us I, I i would even venture to say that all of us know people who have mental health uh challenges in their lives who uh you know whether we're supporting them as family members whether we are they we're the we are themselves, whether we're raising children. Uh, you know, right now we are seeing a huge rise in mental health concerns for our high schoolers and our middle schoolers and even some of our elementary kids, especially coming out of COVID and understanding that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of what COVID has done uh, and the legacy of COVID towards mental health, especially uh, people who had not really ever struggled before find now that they are having increased anxiety, uh, increased um, stress, and all these things. Uh, so I think we still have, uh, we're only scratching the tip of the iceberg and understanding that particular legacy. And, and I think that as we move forward, we're going to find more and more that we have got to address the mental health crisis in our country. I live in a space right now in Georgia where there is a nine month waiting list just to be evaluated for anxiety and depression and there just aren't enough serv you know, service providers. And there's a base just down the road from me where the wait is even longer. 
um, because we don't, they don't have enough, enough people to serve the community. So, so we just, I, I think there's just so much we're not seeing. And I think that tension will continue to grow until we talk about the reality that also people living with physical disabilities, there's a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety as well. And so we're all interconnected. Uh, I'd like to mention that Rev. Jen, to put a warm Rev. Jen, like you, has come out of the closet as dealing with mental health issues. And uh, thank you both. I, now, you're on a topic that is near and dear to my life. You're on a topic that is near and dear to my life. And you, you can bridge physical and mental. And you, you can bridge physical and mental. But I have a bigger challenge to ask you about. But I have a bigger challenge to ask you about. Bridging mental health, consumers, and psychiatric survivors about mental health consumers and psychiatric survivors. Bridging them. Bridging them. I'm both, but it feels like. But it feels like. We who have experienced human rights violations. We who have experienced human rights violations. Are often forgotten. Are often forgotten. I'm in both camps. Help us bridge these two. I'm in both camps. Help us bridge these two. Yeah, and I just, I first want to just acknowledge the the very real uh, trauma that occurs in, in both of those camps and, and how difficult it is, especially when the representation hasn't really been there. Space has not been made to have good conversations and to hear the stories. And I really believe in my heart of hearts that the best way we will continue to bridge those kind of gaps and we will continue to make progress is by by telling our stories and it's not safe for everyone to do that and it's not possible for everyone to do that which is one of the reasons I'm deeply committed in my ministry and in my life to talking about these issues and to normalizing them and to making space for people to share their lived experiences uh, I think far too often we ask people to uh, to survive in silence and by doing that, we not only isolate them, but we lose such a rich part of our disability history. And that is something that I think we really are lacking um, in our country is a real, we don't, you know, we can look at uh, uh, LGBTQIA plus heroes or sheroes or however you want to phrase them. Uh, we can see uh, people of color who we can admire and lift up and, but we don't really have those people as broadly acknowledged and, and pointed to as uh, people within our community. And I really, uh, my daughter is on the spectrum. She is neurospicy as she calls herself. And and, um, you know, one of the things I love about her is that she does claim that loudly and proudly as her one of her identities. There is zero shame in her game. Um, she lives in uh, with extreme anxiety as well. And uh, but she asked me, who are the people? Who do I look to? Who who can I look up to to say, see, they've done, they've made it in this world. They and 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 we have to go looking for them. We have to go hunting for them. So I think making space for us to hear each other's stories is is a profound way to open a door um, and to start to build the bridge between um, our communities and understanding that um, that we need to hear our own stories as well. We need to hear ourselves reflected back, um, knowing that there, I, one of the things that I am so grateful for is knowing that there are other ministers in our denomination who do identify as people who live with mental health challenges and who are saying these things from the pulpit and just knowing that I'm not out there alone makes all the difference in the world. So I really believe, and I accept your challenge, uh, 
of uh, of working towards bridging those gaps. And I believe it starts with forums like this and, and being able to hear each other's stories. And I'm really heartened. If you look at the UUA bookstore website um, in the last three years, you will see a huge influx of new and wonderful books. In fact, I've got a whole stack of them I haven't quite finished, uh, gotten to yet, um, talking about accessibility, talking about mental health, really addressing these topics in a thoughtful, compassionate, community-centered way um, with the disability justice lens. So I think there's a lot of hope. Great. Should we open it up? Yeah, I'll, I'll make one more question. One more question here? During a side of love meeting. During a side of love meeting. I mentioned that it feels like a, an emergency. I mentioned that it feels like an emergency. There's such a push for more forced psychiatry. There's such a push for more forced psychiatry. California to New York. From California to New York. Blue states. Blue state. So uh, what are, the, are your ideas for in the sounding the alarm? So what are your ideas for sounding the alarm? Again, I think it's I think it is continuously talking. I think it is engaging with our state and local representatives in and letting them hear the stories, letting them understand um, from one on one. You know, I living in the deep, deep south, I have learned over the years that lots of times it's one heart, one mind at a time. And while that is slow and painful progress, I can say that I have seen it really make a difference when people have the opportunity to connect one-on-one -on -one with somebody else's story uh, and it shows it kind of reflects back on their own lives and the people that are in their world things start to change uh, if we continue to depend on our representatives to do things uh, based on a financial model which a lot of what we see in our government is based on a financial model not a person centered model um, nothing is going to change in any good way um, and so i think that one of the best ways is to really connect on that local level and then on the state level to try and make sure that uh, the way things are moving has a voice that is representative, not just of this medical model, but of the people who are uh, involved in these systems. Welcome, people, to questions. So Kat, you're the only person who can see the webinar participants and right. And so if you're willing to call out any questions that might pop up online. Rev Amanda, if you see the uh, Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen, there are actually several <laughs> questions there that you can. Oh, wonderful. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see. How would a family or caregiver's perception of disability differ from someone with disability? Is this recognized within your work? Let's see. How would a family or caregiver um, I do believe there is a difference. Um, there is a different lived experience. And I do think it is vitally important that we make space not just for people who are experiencing and living with disabilities, specifically mental health challenges, but also to understand that there is a hopefully a whole uh, community that is supporting and um, and uh, uh, working with those individuals and that they need support too. One of the uh, scariest things for me as a parent um, of a child who who was on the spectrum was feeling like I was alone. 
And, and all the work I was, I was, my daughter was getting all kinds of services and all these things that she needed, but I was not taking care of my own space and, and, and how her challenges and how being her advocate was impacting me. And so I believe that, you know, we need to be opening spaces up to provide that support for families and caregivers, especially when mental, uh, mental health is involved, um, because oftentimes it, there is a ripple impact into um, families. Uh, mostly my scope of the work where that would come into disability justice is again, really just making sure that we are understanding that families of color experience uh, the mental health uh, support system much differently than white identified families do generally, um, and that is and that is because racism and and white supremacy culture is real and exists. Um, and so we know that there are real disparate, uh, dis, uh, disproportionate um, treatments within uh, these systems. And so that's where my work would come into these kind of things is understanding that um, those perceptions also are different based on race and gender and class um, and religious upbringing and all these things. Um, so, you know, there is there is some tension there. And so as communities of faith, I believe that our job then is to help be the bridge, to help um, provide safe spaces for um, families to talk about their experiences and find support with always having that full lens of understanding that we don't always all experience these systems in the same way. Uh, let's see, there's another question from Martha. Uh, I see, I was wondering how much other religions address these issues. Oh my, uh, I I wish I could say that, uh, that they do better than we do um, as Unitarian Universalists, but I don't know that they do. Uh, I do think that there are um, some areas that other denominations may do better and maybe in accessibility. I don't, not quite sure, uh, probably not. Uh, I would say that, you know, really we're all late to the party on this. We just are. We're we're rather late, and my hope is that as Unitarian Universalists, though, that we can start building good good systems and good models of of how to be fully inclusive and how to apply this frame to our justice work, so that other denominations will say, "Hey, I don't want to be left behind," and we'll jump on our bandwagon, as it were. Thanks, Amanda. Let me ask the folks here gathered in the room if anybody has a comment or a question or do you want to engage? Here we go. Just say your name. Hi, Amanda. My name is Kathy Thomas. I am wondering, uh, this effort has been, um, disability justice has been around a long time, or attempts for it. What? would you tell us are some of the best practices that you've seen in UU churches around the country? Oh, I think some of the best practices in terms of disability justice that I've seen have really come from the West Coast, I have to say, uh, most of them uh, from the West Coast. Uh, and really, they involve uh, making sure that there are leadership opportunities for full inclusion uh, of people with disabilities. That is hands down probably the best thing that we can see uh, and making sure that there are opportunities for people with disabilities, specifically mental health challenges as well, um, to uh, be engaged in not only just storytelling, but also direct advocacy and empowering uh, these lived experiences to uh, be at the forefront of our movements. Uh, you know, we far too, it, nothing about us without us, right? I mean, that is the rallying cry. And and I think that is something that we still haven't always gotten right. So uh, more and more what I, my, my hope is that we will, as we continue to uh, make these spaces more accessible, just in general, just getting through into the space, that we will continue to see more leadership possibilities arrive. And understand, the other thing I've seen is understanding that leadership looks different um, 
for different people. And so that just because we have this one model of what leadership is supposed to be, that's not necessarily accessible for everybody else. And so maybe we need to change the model instead of changing, trying to change the people, right? Um, so I think that uh, we need to see more and more direct advocacy. That is something that we've not done so great on, but I do see, uh, especially West Coast congregations, working a little bit stronger on this, uh, I won't say storming the Capitol, but storming the Capitol, right? Um, you know, being out in direct action and, um, and being able to say, you know, our bodies um, matter too, and not only do they matter, matter, but we're going to come in physical space with you, even if that makes you uncomfortable. And, and sometimes that's what it takes um, uh, is, is saying that, you know, we don't have to be this perfect model of someone who overcame our disability. We are living in this body that we have or in this mind that we have. We are full, complete humans and perfectly made in our own beings and that um, you need to deal with us directly. Far too often, uh, the disabled voice has been taken out of the conversation and we've only had the advocates working in. And, and yay for the advocates. We need the advocates and that support. And we need to be centering disabled voices um, in these conversations, in the legislation. We need to be out there writing legislation of our own. I think that's something huge. We 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 depend on uh, advocates lots of times to write this legislation for us without actually even consulting us and asking what is really going to impact your life, what is going to make your life better, what do you need. Even if I don't understand it, even if it doesn't make sense to me or seems trivial, if that is is that is what's going to make your life better, then let's start working towards that in that direct action kind of way. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Does anybody else here want to say something? Question or comment? All right. Uh, anybody else online? There are a couple let's, more questions. Yeah, let's see. Uh, is NAMI helpful with mental health? Uh, you know, I, I can't get into the whole uh, NAMI debate. It is a debate. Um, people love NAMI. And people don't love NAMI, and that's okay. Uh, you know, if if it is serving the needs of one pop of a, of a portion of our population, then I am for that. Uh, I have worked with NAMI in the past on various volunteer opportunities, but uh, we don't have a direct partnership with them at the UUA. Um, but they are uh, one of the many uh, advocacy agencies and groups out there. Um, so let's see, Lydia asks, as new disabilities arrive in the U.S., what advice do you have for the newly disabled to advocate for themselves when the disability type is not yet officially recognized? Oh, yes. Um, we are, as we continue to evolve in our medical understandings and in uh, all the ways in which our, our world is and impacts us, uh, we're going to come up with new diagnoses. I currently live with a, a chronic illness that I, they change my diagnosis every three years or so uh, because I can't quite decide what it is. So I understand that that's a real um, painful way to be. And I think the best advice I can give to someone newly diagnosed with anything, any kind of disability, is to one, know that you are beloved, that you are not broken that you are absolutely not broken. I hear that so often. Um, and that, you know, you just have to unfortunately keep being that driving force. You have to keep uh, at the doctors, keep all kinds of records, keep write down everything <laughs> um, and, and, and find a good support network. Uh, those people that will go with you to doctor's appointments um, to help be the extra set of ears in the room as, as, information is being thrown at you. Um, find those people that you can laugh and cry with and be frustrated with uh, and who are going to support you. And the best people are the ones who ask you, what do you need? What do you need? And then are willing to hear what you need and respond to that. Um, so I think that um, as we continue forward, uh, you know, it is it's always challenging to get a new diagnosis, especially one that doesn't have a name yet. And just know you're not alone. 
if nothing else, just know that you are not alone. There are wide communities out here. And with the internet being what it is and COVID, you know, taught us how to connect on in online spaces in wonderful ways, um, really utilize the online spaces that are out there or or the community connections as they as they come up. Um, and in congregations, I encourage congregations to start disability groups. I think that all of our congregations should have some kind of disability mental health and or mental health support groups um, where uh, caucus spaces where people can come together and um, share their experiences, pool their knowledge base and pool their ability to be able to go out and change the world. Jean Marie, Jean -Marie uh, you have your hand up in chat. Did you want to say something? Give her just a second to see if she wants to unmute and say something. Hello, Jean Marie. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had to get my computer back to the right space before I could know if I was unmuted or not. Um, I would like to say that I think this has been really an interesting discussion. And one of the books I read that really talked a lot about this theological stuff was my, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's called My Body is Not a Prayer Request, um, which was just really helpful because, you know, people would always talk about, did I want God to heal me? I'm like, well, no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very good book. It's pretty short and, um, you know, people might find it interesting. Yes, thank you. It is a great book. Um, I was so excited to see it. And and I do hope people, uh, if you have a moment, will take the time to, to digest that um, because it, it is a wonderful book. And I did want to answer, there was one more uh, in the chat that I wanted to make sure I got to. Uh, what about challenging profound social structures that oppress disabled persons as well as other marginalized groups? And um, yes, we need to be challenging uh, these systems. And, you know, yes, we do it through storytelling, as as I, I've, I've mentioned through uh, storytelling. Um, and and I think, again, we need to be out on the streets legislating. We need to work through uh, making sure that um, we are uh, fighting against laws. The other the other thing that is really always amazes people when I tell them this, and I think it's important that, you know, that we make sure as many people know this as possible. The ADA um, is only enforceable through litigation. Did you all know that? That the ADA is only enforceable through litigation. So there is no um, structure set up for the ADA um, to be challenged or to be uh, an ADA violation to be fixed um, unless it goes through the court system, which places an undue financial and um, just general life burden on the person who has experienced uh, the, the, the oppressive moment or, or the oppressive space. And so, you know, working towards changing that alone would be a huge um, shift in how uh, our society views and works uh, to make sure that we have more accessible spaces. I think there are a lot of ways that we can work to challenge these systems. Uh, I also don't believe in not reinventing the wheel. And so we know that there are justice movements that are working and have been working for years and years and years. Um, and being able to put this lens on top of that work already, I think will serve us in wonderful ways. It, but it means creating partnerships. And it also means changing some hearts and minds and attitudes about what disability means, what it looks like, what it um, feels like, what its limitations are, and how we move in the world and understanding that each person's disability is very unique to them. And I think that's what scares people uh, when they think about uh, tackling these issues is that, wow, it's such a big thing. 
but it's so important that we do it because we know that 57.8 million Americans struggle with mental health concerns alone. And we know that 20 million of our children struggle with mental health concerns. So that's one in five. Um, so just mental health alone uh, impacts such a wide swath of our country um, that, you know, we can't we can't ignore it anymore. So I do think we need to be on the streets. I do think we need to be in the legislature. I think we need to be sitting on school boards. I think we need to be, uh, you know, present and out in the world. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Last chance for a final word here. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Uh, Rev. Amanda, have you had the delight of hearing about Reverend Philip Shulman? Reverend Amanda, have you had the delight of hearing about Reverend Philip Shulman? Yeah. I don't believe I have. Well, he was one of our ministers when we got married. He was one of our ministers when he, we got married. As well as one of my best friends. As well as one of my best friends. And he's a UU minister in Texas. He's a UU minister in Texas. And well, I'll uh, let folks know about his son. He was raised Catholic and Jewish, by the way. He was raised Catholic and Jewish. But he is a, I call him the Mad Movement Minister. I call him the Mad Movement Minister. Very supportive of uh, our human rights. Very supportive of our human rights. And, uh, and I could talk for an hour about it right now. You could talk for an hour about him. He's uh, but, a TBI supporter. Uh, uh, also, yeah, an extreme TBI survivor an extreme tbi survivor a half ton truck hit him but i'll just uh i want to say a follow-up question about the families i want to say a follow-up question about the families because reverend philip is great on this because reverend philip is great on this how do we include extremely hurt folks who reject any mention of a disability they, they how do we help folks who are ex going through extreme crises who refuse no, they've been extreme like we have a survivor forced shock here like we have a survivor forced shock here christina yates christina yates so how do we uh include folks who sometimes will reject how do we uh, how do we build a bridge to folks who who might reject much of the system how do we build a bridge with folks who might reject much of the system i mean if we refer to mental health struggles we lose some of it in them if we refer to mental health struggles, we, we lose some of them. You know, that is a that is a difficult space to occupy. And, you know, we I'm not sure I really have a good answer. I think, uh, you know, we all uh, sometimes fail to live up to our best selves and our best values. And um, we have to understand that people who reject the idea that mental health struggles exist and people who um, would uh, want to see compulsory uh, mental health um, treatment oftentimes are working out of a place of fear um, themselves and and deep sadness and grief and that can be hard to see in that way um, I think a lot of times people who struggle to talk about mental health or who reject the idea of of mental health struggles at all uh, are really just deeply afraid 
because when we start realizing that, you know, we can have mental health problems, things we can't see, um, that becomes very scary because people look at me and they're like, oh, she's fine. You know, she, she doesn't live with anxiety. She, she's bubbly and happy and engages with all these people. And what they don't see is what goes on behind. And so when we start, when I start talking about, oh, the anxiety that sort of rips and roars through my body pretty constantly, um, you know, that then can trigger a fear in other people that, oh, wow, well, what's lurking inside of me that I don't know? And so I think that um, when we when we encounter people like that, first and foremost, we have to remember that we all have our own stories. We all have our own traumas and the own places that we come from. And you're not going to change every heart and mind. And what we, but what we can do is continue to live into our authentic selves and to continue to make space for um, our lived reality so that uh, hopefully uh, they, the people who might reject that would come into a better understanding. Uh, I do think that it is incumbent upon all of us who are able to advocate for those who um, do not have the ability in whatever moment to advocate for themselves. So if in, in partnership, so if, you know, if we know that someone is being uh, forced into compulsory treatment and they don't want it to be able to be an ally to them um, is extremely important. And, and I think that is uh, first and foremost, the most important thing. Building bridges is important, but making sure that our beloveds are safe and well cared for and that their wishes are honored, uh, I think is, is primary uh, before even building those bridges. So I don't know that I have a good answer beyond to say that I do recognize uh, where a lot of that comes from. It doesn't make it right or easier, but it, it, it does help me sometimes understand and engage in more thoughtful and deep conversational space with them. Shall we wrap up? I, I'll just, I want to say that people like Christina and Philip. I want to say people like Christina and Philip. They're amazing, supportive. They're amazing, supportive. Folks in the movement. Folks in the movement. Change the mental health system who changed the mental health system. Yeah, this movement has been going for like more than 50 years. And this movement has been going for like more than 50 years. Yeah, so uh, thank you for helping me become more visible. So thank you for helping us become more visible. I will say that for those who don't know, the disability justice movement came out of a wonderful adaptive dance company called Sins Invalid, uh, which is based out of California. They are still in operation and a beautiful, beautiful uh, movement and dance troupe uh, who uh, brought this idea forward. So if you haven't heard of Sins Invalid, I encourage you to check them out. That's great. Thank you so much, Reverend Amanda. Thanks for being with us. And we will light our, or we'll extinguish our chalice with our usual words. You know them too, Amanda. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of love, and the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you so much for being with us, everyone. Thanks for logging in. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Cat Patrick. Amazing this. You said thanks, Cat. No Thank you, Cat. And Rev Jan. And Rev Jan. And David. <laughs> and the ATF. Yay. And Patrick. Right. Yes, and Patrick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.